Friday, usually our day one, we're already veterans at this uh, point. We're day two. We're already fried out. <laughs> uh, who uh, we, uh, how does it, uh, that is to say, who's the first? Who's the... <laughs> oh, you see, Robbie and I, uh, we don't um, pay attention or read the program or know what we're doing. So every now and then we have to act like we don't know and it's like a bit, oh, Robbie, you know darn well who's next. Ha 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 And he doesn't. And if I say the name, he won't know what song to start with. So I'm not going to do that to you, but I'm just going to give you, I'll give you a clue. Yeah, what does it rhyme with? Flachel Snyder. Got it. <laughs> Guys, Flachel Snyder. What, what, what was your rhyme yesterday? It was, uh, snozz it. Snozz it, right? Yeah, sure it does. <sighs> snozz it, which very well may, I think that's like a... Something in uh, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, it's going to be a t-shirt later today, so it'll be something. <laughs> I think there is, there's like a... What, he says something about snozzit? Snozzleberry. You know, snozzleberry. Snozzleberry. That's... Snozzleberry? Wow, that's... What's a snozzleberry? That's, what that's my British accent. Snozzle. I don't know if you've heard that before. It's I didn't recognize it. Fantastic. No, did the Brits. Um, there's a gentleman here who made... On the heels of you talking a lot about clay penises yesterday, there's a gentleman here who literally made... A, a statue of me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you, you, there you are. You have that? Do you have it with you? Yeah, bring it tomorrow because I want. We actually have a clay dick here. At the, <laughs> like, it's, uh, is this is a family event. Rick? I don't know if you want to pull that out. But. I don't know. What do you think about it, Clay? That's just, maybe that might be the time. It's Richard's baby. He's got a little statue of himself. Sure do. People say, is that a dildo? He says, no, it's a statue of me. It's my play dick. Third two kids. That's right. Our first two. Right. We'll do first two after this. we got to make this person come on stage. Yeah, it's Flacho Flosset. <laughs> Flacho from Fighter. You just said that her last name rhymes with Closet. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get this party started with one of the classic people on the circuit. There's no one finer. There's no one finer than Rachel Snuff. <laughs> to know that we know you well and, and consider you a close friend and Rob knows that your last name does not rhyme with Snozzit. I, I don't know what that was. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> it was definitely all Rob's fault, I'm sure. Well, always. It's always all my fault. Why stop now? You remember the first time Rachel Minor was a, a guest when the band was playing and our song with you, for you, was everything that rhymed with minor. Yes. Great. Which there are actually never forget that yeah. moment. I think it might have been in a minor key. <laughs> You're Rachel Minor. Da, 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 da. Yes. Nobody's finer. That's good. She gave me a shiner. <laughs> when I called her, when I called her a flosset. All right, let's get the hell out of Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel. I love you all so much. For anyone who didn't see, wasn't facing this direction, some people were holding up some beautiful signs and I believe in you and I believe in unicorns and I love you so freaking much. I don't know how to say it. And are you having a good time? Because that's what's important. I'm feeling kind of emotional today. I might just cry at you a lot. <laughs> Um, I, I just, I love this family so much and I've been watching you come together and 
pick each other up and, and find the joy and excitement after the announcement. And I know some of you were hurting and it was just so beautiful to watch everyone come together and just like, you know, find how to help each other and hold each other's hands through everything. Um, that is who you are and that is what defines this family and that is not going anywhere ever and no one can cancel that. I, I hope you all know that like this family is never ending. I love you. And I love your unicorn. I see so many beautiful unicorns in the audience and it's making me very happy. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, mine is a hypothetical question. Yes. Um, so, considering the turn the show has taken now and the alternate universe, if Meg were to come back, what kind of character do you think she would be in terms of morality? In terms of morality? That's a really interesting question. First of all, um, I would be delighted with any in any kind of form that Meg took, and I think there's a lot of fun directions you could go with that. Um, I think one of the things that I love about the show so much in terms of how it handles morality and ethics is that it really shows that we all live somewhere in the grays. There is no black and white, and we're all trying to do our best, and we're figuring it out. And um, I love that there's not, you know, angels are not always good, demons are not always bad. We are finding ourselves through all of this. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know exactly where she would sit. I think she would still have feelings for Cass, because for whatever reason, I just believe that that's Thank you. Thought eternal. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, um, so that might help kind of point her in certain moral directions, but... Hey! Hi! How are you? I'm really good. Um, it's good to see you. Oh, I, I was just wondering, I just wanted to ask you, um, I've struggled a lot with school and having autism, and it's just really made it hard for learning with me, and I'm in my first year of college and I haven't finished yet, but what, what kind of advice would you give to me about if I was thinking about like just giving up because it's just too hard. I'm just, well, one first, I want to say sorry you're you're <laughs> feeling that and you're going through that. Um, I have a lot of different pieces of advice, but mostly it's that you've got to find what works for you. Find those things that inspire you. Find what's important to you. Any kind of reflecting you can do on what it is that you, what makes you feel good and part of this world and connected and uh, gravitate toward those things. I don't think that we should ever keep trying to force something that makes us miserable because maybe there's a reason, maybe there's something that you're tapping into, but also life is not easy and we're all fighting our, the good fight to get through it. So, uh, so it's a matter of you knowing for yourself and really being honest with yourself about whether you're avoiding it just because it's scary, but it actually is something that is rewarding, or if uh, it's something that isn't what you want to be doing um, and who you want to be around. And I think that's some of the most important things is also find the humans that you want to be around and that make you feel okay about you. Um, because the, they exist, and you know we're here, uh, all over the place, um, and just because you aren't feeling like you fit around certain people does not mean you won't fit around others, and that'll help guide you to what is right. Does that help? Out? I love you all so much, and, and you know what? You all have taught me that too over and over again. So uh, you're why I feel like suddenly that, oh my gosh, there are places I belong. Because uh, I'm very different and didn't fit in a lot of the time and uh, was never good at 
BSing and pretending I fit in when I didn't. Um, so, uh, and somehow that has led me to all of you, which makes me feel whole and happy. And that's what I hope you find. Thank you so much, I love you. And good luck. And oh, oh my goodness, I don't think there is a single human, so I'm sure none of us uh, have had an existence where it's always uh, peaches and cream and, uh, you know, there, there is a fight to life and you have to find that, really, you know, fight for that joy. So, get that. Hi, Rachel. Hey. Love you, first of all. Love you, too. And thank uh, you. It's good to see you. You, too, hon. The picture was awesome. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that I thought Meg went from not knowing what she really wanted as a leader to turning into someone that was really about the fight, you know, like for the good, and how she died at the end, you know, for the boys, and to go on and, and finish the fight with the Leviathans and all that. How do you feel she felt about that? Do you think she felt she ended as a hero, a good thing? It, there was an interesting thing about Meg. One, um, I would argue that she was always, like the qualities that made her who she was were consistent throughout. She was always very loyal. She was fiercely loyal. She fought for her um, causes, and the cause was always more important than <coughs> the immediate consequence to her. Uh, she had awesome perspective always. Um, I love the fact that she found a better path um, to uh, bring those qualities to. Um, but I think that that was there, that potential was there always, and that was who she was. Um, what I loved about her sacrifice was that it was one of those decisions that was like breathing. It was a given. It was just who she was and what she was going to do. It was like, of course, she wasn't going to let uh, Cash fall. Like she was going to do anything she could to help him. But it wasn't. There wasn't a show about it. It wasn't something she had to wrestle with uh, mentally or anything like that. It was just, yeah, this is this is how life goes. Um, so, uh, so that's what I felt about her. It was just she was being her. Um, and there's no better feeling than that, so no, I don't think she would have had any question left in her mind. I really, really love that you and him do random acts together. It's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> yes, for anyone who doubts for a second, random acts is the joy of my life. Uh, so, uh, it's just, again, it's... It's just a testament to sometimes we can think things are going wrong in our life and it actually leads to things going very right because I couldn't imagine an existence that I'm happier with than the one I have. Um, and it took a lot of things seeming to not go the way I wanted them to um, in order to get there. So uh, it's a good reminder. Hey. hey, Rachel, I just wanted to ask, what was it like doing the marathon with the Supernatural cast and, and how that all brought you guys together as a family? It's um, <coughs> something that means so much to me. It was not easy. Uh, it was easy for me physically, uh, not easy for them physically, but it was very, very hard mentally from my point of view because uh, the last thing I ever feel comfortable with or want is to, to make people uh, work harder or to be a problem or to be a burden. It's it, like it took one of my biggest fears. Um, and so, so the fact that they all had to put in more physical effort and stuff to push me was really hard for me to allow, but I also thought what a beautiful moment it was for people to see how genuinely good this group is. And, uh, and it is such a testament to who all of them are as human beings that there was never a doubt in their minds that they wanted me to be a part of that and that they would do whatever in order to make that happen. Um, and to see that manifest to, and to, to know that I was a part of others getting to see that and getting to see what it is to have true friendships and real groups 
where we support each other and where we don't let another one falter and uh, where we don't leave each other behind. That to me was such an important message that I was willing to like take the hit of like my pride of, of having to be helped uh, in order to get that out there. And then also, of course, like raising the money for Random X and helping with child, you know, combat childhood hunger and that whole program. And the fact that that meant so much to so many people that um, that was. I, I don't know how, I don't have words for it. It, um, really, it really was the inspiration of the watch, and I just wanted to say thank you from all of us, because watching that, especially seeing you, you know, like getting pushed, and then also when Jared and Jensen crossed the finish line together, I can't tell you how much that means to us, so thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is a beautiful, I love this family so much. It's a beautiful group. I love that we all get to share these moments together. Hi, Rachel. Hey. I wanted to ask, what was it like doing that scene where hmm, Cass kisses you? <laughs> it's funny, no one's ever asked that before. <laughs> no, uh, it was, I, I've joked a lot, um, that, but it was actually really a lovely moment for a couple of reasons. Um, one is why I was just talking about this earlier. Um, one, I was physically struggling already by that point, uh, and I lied, I, well, I said it was my back because I thought it was my back, and then I kind of kept the lie going, um, I just <coughs> contradict it, um, but I was having trouble doing the pivot turn, so to me, one of my favorite moments is when Misha picks me up and kind of moves me around, he was actually doing that as a friend to just be helpful. Um, and it's just a testament to who he is, uh, but it also looks pretty hot. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, and I love, I, for me, I love those two characters together so much, so it is more from the point of view of like, getting to be a part of that in any way is just really cool. So I, I love it in the same way that anyone else does of getting to watch that is really uh, a cool thing, getting to be a part of making that happen. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And, and yeah, Misha's a decent kisser. <laughs> Hi honey, how are you? Hey, um, good, how are you? I'm good. I wanted to say first of all that I think it's fantastic that the unicorn has now become associated with you because it's not just about being magical and beautiful. Unicorns are also a symbol of power and majesty and I can't think of a better animal to be associated with you. Thank you. Um, so, I feel very, very lucky. I feel, uh, yeah, anyway. Thank, my, thank you for saying that. My question is, outside of unicorns, what is your favorite mythological creature? Well, it's interesting. Um, unicorns weren't originally, that's more, it's, it's how I, I associate unicorns with you all as well. And that's, it's, so it's become, it's something that has grown out of us that has given me that love. But in terms of mythical creatures, I love um, phoenixes. I've got a phoenix tattoo. Um, I love fairies. I've got a fairy tattoo. I've always loved fairies. That's probably number one. Um, and uh, I, I love basically all mythical creatures. Dragons are amazing. That's what my tattoo is. What about, yeah, I was going to ask what yours is. So dragons are yours? Uh, dragons, because my sister and I, both of our first tattoos were dragons. And that's, awesome. that's so that was something important for me as, and my sister. So, so thank awesome. you so much. Thank you. The important thing is magical creatures are amazing. We all agree, right? And they exist. We are them. Uh, That's right. I, uh, I love you, one. But one of my friends, she's into D and D. Her name is Nadine, and she wanted me to ask. Oh, her, awesome! She wanted me to ask you this question: What would you think that Meg's alignment would be? Would she be more chaotic, neutral, chaotic, evil, or something else? Well, she was chaotic evil, and she sub she switched to her alignments to chaotic good, I guess, right? That's what I would think. Um, I like to think of my th myself as chaotic good. I've got that, actually, I've got that sticker on my scooter. Um, but 
thank your friend for me because D and D rocks. And I love yes, I love that. Um, no, and it's an, it's a, another wonderful lens to look and play through. She will be so excited that you said that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and and I am happy to answer as many D and D questions. Rachel, Hi. I just want to say first that we all love you too, and thank you so much for all you do for the community, for Random Acts, and for us. And um, my question is, I don't know how up to date you are with the show, if you're watching the show at all, but um, with the end sadly coming, I'm thinking about ways that they can wrap things up. And in the show right now, Castiel has made an enemy of the Keeper of the Empty, and he's got this thing hanging over his head where the moment he feels happy, that's when the empty is going to come. Yeah, and so that's I killing me. I, I can't deal with that story. I'm like, no. Can anyone else like process that? I'm, I'm total to that. And so my fantasy is that Meg comes back, and in a moment of uh, intimacy, Cass is happy, and that's when the empty comes and takes Oh, my God! I think this is a perfect opportunity for Meg to come back, and I think that's the only thing that will make Cass ha really happy. I love that idea, but also, uh, if that happens, what I can tell you is there are zero chances that I will not sob. <laughs> that's um, that that that's like epically beautiful. Yeah, love that. Um, yeah. Hello. But also, I, I kind of like the scenario, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, my question is, do you think when Meg was flirting with Castiel, it was strictly a joke, and what made her look closer? What do you think that, what, sorry, what Meg is, um, what made Meg uh, look closer at Castiel in like a relationship? And like, was she strictly joking in the beginning? I, I think what happened was the way that, um, I don't know, this is my, my truth is that sometimes like when you're connected to people and when they hit you on that very deep level you don't always have like a logical reason why and you don't always like like to me it never makes sense necessarily on paper it's just like no I know you and I'm supposed to be around you and I, I feel that um, and that's what I felt about those two characters <laughs> however you want to interpret it. And I think that uh, it's important to me because I think, and here I'm gonna enter into some tricky territory, but like in terms of shipping and everything, we should all be allowed to dream whoever we want to be together. Um, so I think there are any number of valid interpretations depending on what, what worked for your heart. And I support that, but, uh, but I, I think that, um, to me, whatever form you want to put that in, they just knew they were supposed to be together, and they just worked um, uh, on, on whatever level. And they just needed, like, she just needed to protect him. That was obviously genuine. She supported him and sacrificed herself for him without blinking an eye. And it was just because, like, that was what she knew she needed to do. Does that, does that like, a, a weird... Answer or well, that's, thank you. <laughs> but of course, like the humor was always there. I think the humor was a, a par partly to offset the fact that she had those feelings because she didn't know how. Like she wasn't even supposed to have it, feelings for anything or any anyone from her point of view. So I think the humor helped to just kind of like offset the fact that like eh, I'm feeling these things. Um. You're weird. <laughs> that was Thank you very much. And by the way, um, earlier, you know, uh, you said something about random acts and everything uh, that I do, and I just want to say it's everything that you do, and it means so much uh, just to see all the good that you all put in the world, and please know that 
that has more worth than anything and uh, it's just moving beyond words and you are a force to be reckoned with, so, yeah. Hi Rachel, hey. you're beautiful as always. I don't know if you remember Carson Blake and Lisa from the Denver Con. Yeah. Okay, so Carson wanted to say hello. She wasn't able to make it and she wanted to invite you to her wedding that's in May. And I told her I'd at least invite you. Oh, but... please, please thank her, thank her, thank her. That's wonderful. I, I know that May, 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 I'm traveling a lot. I'll be like in California and Australia and like all sorts of So like, it's not likely that that could happen. But I am there in spirit, and I wish her so much happiness, and that's such a beautiful thing. I will tell her. But my question for you is, once this is all done, what do you see yourself doing after all of this? This has just been so amazing that you guys have all given your time and love to. What's going to happen after this? I don't know, and I love that I don't know. And... and um, First of all, I, I think it's important that there's a couple of things to unpack in that. One, I think that we should all see the possibility. Like there is, there have been so many times in my life, I know that I've hit that thing of like, I don't see what's happening next. And then beautiful, amazing things happen that I never would have guessed. Um, so, like, there's so much. These are amazing, creative, good people. I know whatever they're going to be putting in the world is going to be something worth watching and something exciting to see. So, um, rather than looking at it as, like, just an end to anything, um, I'm just excited to see all the possibilities. I'm excited to see what happens in season 15. I'm excited to see what happens after season 15. Um, and it's also not like the conventions are suddenly going to end or we're suddenly going to drop off the face of the earth. This supernatural family exists and it will keep existing. And I think that's really important for us to all have perspective on. Like, look at the Star Trek fandom. That, if anything, grew and, you know, became more of a thing after the show ended. So. Let, let's not look at this as an end, and let's see what beautiful things this is going to spin into. Uh, that's my two cents. Plus, I hope I will still be working with Random X, and we will be doing good things, and I don't think that is limited to being about the show. I think we can all bring that out into the world and keep spreading that message and that goodness. Well, I absolutely agree with you there. I think you guys, that's the biggest part of all of this, is what you guys have done good for the communities and the world um, that can never be even numbered. Um, so we do all appreciate that, but um, we appreciate you and just, we're, we love you. So thank you so much. And I'm glad to know that this is gonna keep on going. I love you so much and, and same. And you know, and again, it's like, let's, it's up to all of us, so, so let's just keep creating whatever is, is going to be next. And we'll, we might know, you know, we'll keep dreaming it up. Let's all keep doing that together. Thank you, God bless Thank you. you. Hello. Hi. Um, so my question is, how would you describe Meg to someone who wasn't familiar with Supernatural? Um, to me, like the same way that I, I, I that I would someone who was, I, I've never. Um, I guess one of the things to me that was funny was like from the beginning when Meg was described to me, I didn't know supernatural, and she just made sense. It was like, oh yeah, so like she's a demon, she's inhabiting a body that's not hers, and um, so she just always made sense to me uh, from a personality point of view. I fell in love with her loyalty. I love her perspective. I think one of the things that I hooked into right away is like she lived an awful lot of life, so to speak, and seen an awful lot. Um, and so therefore, those little things that we often think are so big, she's not gonna be distracted by. Um, and I, I, that was one of my favorite things about her. How would you describe Meg? 
Um, I actually don't know. She seems like such a complex character to me, but I do love her character and I love her sass. Yes, I will well say one of the things is she just said the best lines. Like, yeah. uh, and that's I, that's not my credit. That the writer. She just got. I always got to say the coolest thing. She was so witty always. Um, so I love that about her. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering what was your point of view between Meg and Dean's love hate relationship. Um, it was just fun. Like talk about witty lines. We just had so much fun together. Um, I always, I, I felt like part of the fun of it was there was like a certain amount of respect between the two of them. Um, there's that thing of like you can have a foe and still respect, like I think they, they respect each other's wit and things like that and um, I, I love that she could one-up him in that game sometimes. Um, I, don't know. She was. I felt. I always felt very strong. Uh, Any time it got to be Meg, and I. I feel like uh, that was a lot. Because Dean is such a strong, like stable, solid character, and so it was fun to not be. I. I loved that Meg was never thrown by that. Like he, she was. Un, she was not shaken by him, and he was not shaken by her, and I think that was very rare for both of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you so much. What about you? Do you have anything to add? Um, I think it was... I don't know. I have it in my head, but I don't know how to say it. I think that Dean just liked Meg because how she looked. Like, not on personality-wise. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, I would like to know, with you working closely with Misha and Random Acts, have you ever um, looked into uh, judging or anything the Gish items? And if you have, do you have a favorite? I have not judged the Gish items. It's it's an interesting thing because not like Gish is separate. That's you know that's other other people's domain. Like Charlie Capen does an amazing job. Uh, there and Misha, they all work really hard and all that stuff. They've surprised me with items. I've written, one time I wrote an item for them. Um, I, I love getting to see, I, I'm a fan of Gish, so I love getting to see all of your contributions and uh, just so, you're so freaking creative. Um, so I've always enjoyed that. Um, and I enjoy some of the, like, fun, uh, I guess to me, like, more, like, intellectual slash artistic exercises. So, like, when, when there were stormtroopers suddenly showing up in all the, like, old, old photos and things. Or, uh, I know I joked one time, like, it was literally just a Twitter joke of, I, they were doing the 12 Days of Gishmas. And I joked about a porg uh, in a portrait by Da Vinci, and it was literally just because it rhymed or it kind of sounded correct uh, for you know a portrait in a pear tree. And um, I, the creative things that people did with that were just incredible, um, and I loved it. Got added into as a gish item, but it was that was kind of a happenstance. Um, does all that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all who play Gish because it's so fun and entertaining to watch. And I did participate as because of the connection to Random X and uh, Misha and the, like our connection. Uh, we didn't want there to be any question of was it fair or not, so we don't we don't play competitively. But a lot of the random act staff plays just because we want to have fun and play. Hello, thank Hi. you so much for being here. Thank you. So I wanted to ask if you thought that <coughs> Meg has always been able to have feelings while being a demon, or if she became more human after a meeting Team Free Will. So if if she always had feel like human type feelings. Yes. I 
very curious about this. I mean, because it gets into interpretation that I feel like encroaches on other people's imaginations and creative things. So I don't know what the, like, I think it's valid whatever any of your rules are for whether demons have those kind of human attributes that are not or what's going on there. But I felt like Meg was an example of the fact that that is inherent and that exists and that potential is there. Um, I think it was probably always there because I don't think it suddenly appeared. Um, but I, I don't think she, I think she was able to deny it and uh, sublimate it or whatever until uh, she met Cass. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm always curious. I'm like, am I do, uh, it, does that work with everyone else's imaginations and things? Uh, I, yeah, well, I mean, I think that as a demon, you've gone through so much trauma that yeah. that shutting down of feelings is a defense mechanism. Right. You can't right. feel them because you would yeah. be in pain every day from being in hell. Yeah. I think so. She, what she was saying was that as a demon, that you've been through so much trauma that you then shut down your emotions. Um, kind of as a coping mechanism type is basically yeah. uh, and I think that that is a pretty truthful interpretation of what happens to any of us and that's what I love about fantasy is you can sometimes touch on human truths in a deeper way than you would by just talking about reality um, and uh, and yeah, that's that's how I kind of always interpret it because it's a human truth too. That when you see people that get kind of angry in the world and mean or stop caring or whatever, it's usually a defense. Um, it's usually because they can no longer cope with how much they're feeling. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on something really random, but I. Uh, I have a lot of affinity for, and very well could be uh, on the spectrum as well, so I have a lot of affinity for people who are on the spectrum, and that's one of the fallacies that annoys me, is that uh, people think sometimes that if you're on the spectrum, you don't have empathy, <laughs> and it's often the exact opposite. And there are wonderful things. There's a book called The Reason I Jump. Has anyone read that? Awesome. Uh, well, more of you should. It's not, it's not a hard read, um, but it's written from the point of view of a boy who's autistic um, and, uh, and shut in and can't always communicate. But the truth is that a lot of times it's an overwhelming amount of empathy and feeling and an inability to know what to do with that. Uh, so you get there's like a certain amount of shutdown in terms of how you're expressing it. And I feel like that is often true of humans, and maybe demons. <laughs> anyway, that was my long-winded. Hi, Rachel. Um, I, I'm so excited to see you. I, uh, I fell in love with you as Nick because of the way you deliver your lines. It's like you can take a throwaway line and make it a feast. I just love listening to you. Have you been told throughout your career to, like, modulate that or change your delivery because it's so distinctive and beautiful. Thank you so much. That's such a cool compliment. Well, one, I feel like that is just a testament to my admiration of the writing. Like, I luxuriate in getting to say those things because to me they worked, they were just brilliant and they worked on so many levels. Um, so that's one of the fun things. Just my nerd brain was very happy with getting to say those lines. Um, I, I don't know, I probably just haven't been cast when <laughs> people didn't like the way I said or interpreted things. Um, I think that's the more likely thing. Um, so it tended to work like, for the characters I get cast as, uh, and uh, in terms of that dynamic of, of really uh, enjoying getting to say things the way that it makes sense for me to say them, that's... That's probably the answer. I did have one time where I got cast, they said I was the only actress who interpreted the character in any way, the way that I did, and it wasn't how she was intended to be written. Um, I found out later she was actually written as a ditz, 
and and uh, not very bright. And I thought she was brilliant because she would give advice, like you know, someone would come to her and say, "And my boyfriend is blah blah blah." She'd be like, "So break up with him," and then they keep going, "Yeah, but blah blah blah." So stay with him. And I thought that was the best advice ever because you know that's what like you know just go with whatever. Okay, if that's true, then go with that. Um, but apparently that was supposed to be her, you know, like a, a testament to her dizziness. I just never played it that way. Yeah. So again, just things work out the way they're supposed to, I guess. Aww, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for that compliment. That was really cool. Hi. My question for you is, what is your favorite part about doing random acts? That's a really, I love it, it all of it so much. Um, two th I mean, main thing is the people. Uh, getting to work with people who just want to make the world better for no other agenda, no other reason, is just the best kind of, um, I guess, uh, the most healing thing that I could imagine. Um, and of course it's just, what I've always wanted is to feel like me being on this earth somehow could make other people's lives better. And so getting to every day be working on, on doing that in some way is just, uh, I couldn't ask for more. Um, so the projects that we're working on just on a daily basis just move me. And um, getting to I do love getting to steer things. Uh, I've spent a lot of time studying of what might actually help people, and it's really nice to be able to bring that perspective up, like steer things. So, no, no, I don't think that's actually going to help people in the long run versus I think this will uh, is a beautiful thing. But really, really, it's the people I get to work with. It's everyone volunteering, everyone helping, everyone on staff. It's just incredible. Like. I, I, you know, it's it's such a fallacy that anyone says this world is made up of greedy, you know, people because we might see a lot of them, they might be loud, but oh my goodness, there are some amazing humans out there. So, does that answer? Yes, yeah, that was beautiful, thank you. And that's all of you, any of you who support Random X, that's a testament to you. Because also, by the way, one of the things is the majority of people that support this organization cannot afford to, necessarily. You would think that the people who volunteered and gave money and all that are people who have extra money and time to spend, and therefore it's a fun thing to do. No, it's not. It's it's because it's in, there's an empathy factor of, hey, I've been through stuff, I want to help other people who are going through stuff, and uh, we're giving our own, despite. So, it's a beautiful thing. That's awesome. Hello, Rachel. Hey. So, my question for you is, how would Azazel feel knowing his daughter Meg has sided with the Winchesters? Probably not very happy. Um, she definitely switched loyalties there. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a no-brainer. I don't think there's any winning him over on that. I don't think I would get Dad's approval. Uh, so yeah, that's a pretty quick answer. But I, I don't know how else to interpret. I'm like, there's no amount, I, I think Meg would know it, there is no amount of debating that would win him over on that one. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you. Hey. Um, so I'm very glad because you do an amazing job as Meg, but um, we've seen it where logically Meg has left her vessel and has come back to the same vessel. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on why? <laughs> because it's supernatural. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that there's any, I just, I just think that it's awesome. They're, I mean, they they always come up with some reason for each of us in the many times that we've managed to like reanimate bodies and things like that. But uh, that what I love is supernatural logic is is its own logic. Um, do you have any better interpretation? Um, 
Not really. I personally, because Crowley does it too, um, I just thought maybe it's um, something like they look kind of like they did in life or something like that, but I just didn't know, so thank Yeah, you. no, I mean, I definitely think there's, there's rationale behind it, and they obviously get affinity for, their, for certain meat suits. Um, and they get used to running that, and that's understandable. I think any of us could, could you know, understand that logic. Um, and I think Meg is just really powerful and badass, and if she wants something, she can get her way. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Um, so my question was, I have been listening to the Wayward Podcast, absolutely love oh, awesome. hearing you. Um, was wondering if you were going to plan on coming back and if there's any particular topics you wanted to address. Well, obviously, uh, the three of us will talk about anything and everything. Um, we didn't go in with a heck of a love agenda. Uh, we just like being able to talk to each other, and it's super fun, and talk to all of you. So I leave it up to those ladies, but, uh, but yeah, I would go back anytime because it's just fun. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do feel like I'm probably very inappropriate because I'm way too comfortable talking to them. I, you know, if, if you are inappropriate, then Rob and I are in serious trouble. You're the most appropriate, inappropriate person I've ever met. Thank you. Have you ever heard me on the Wayward Podcast? No, maybe I should. <laughs> if I get to hear Rachel Minor bleeped, I, uh, I'll be very excited. I, I, I'm going to... Wage in a bet they don't bleep anybody on the way no, we're talking. No, they don't. They don't. We just we just say it. Just it's say out it. there and it's recorded for you know for history to know. <laughs> well, Robbie. <laughs> hey, yeah, but well, you know I'm running to download some way I'm going to make some Rachel Minor curse words my new ring, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Rachel Minor. <laughs> Oh, great.